Hello and welcome to this video. So in this video, I'll be discussing the OSPF working mechanism. How exactly does OSPF do what it has to do? We've seen that every link state routing protocol will start by establishing a neighbor relationship, will start by recognizing their neighbors. And after establishing a neighbor relationship, they're going to exchange the link state database. They exchange the link status um, uh, 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 advancements from one router to the other and the other to this one. And after that, they go ahead and do a calculation based on the shortest path fast algorithm from which they generate the shortest path tree, which is the shortest path to each and every node in the network. After that, they get entries from the shortest path tree and get them right into the routing information base. How exactly does OSTF do this? How do we understand this process in the perspective of OSPF in particular. So before getting detailed into the relationship, uh, into the working mechanism, before uh, giving details into the working... Before speaking details about the actual working mechanism itself of OSPF, there is an important detail I want us to understand, which is the relationship between OSPF routers. Now, there are two very important concepts about the relationship between OSPF routers. One is the neighbor relationship, and the other is the adjacency relationship. They're a bit confusing at the beginning, but after doing a few labs and following along, you'll be able to get the clear-cut difference between the two. So let's imagine a simple network with about two routers that are directly connected as such. So if we have router 1 and router 2, and we have enabled OSPF at that interface, enabled OSPF at this interface also. The routers, as we've mentioned, will start to send and to listen to hello packets. So that guy sends his hello packet out there, and this interface also sends its hello packet to this direction. Now, once the two routers discover each other through the hello packets, what they have formed is what you call the neighbor relationship. That's really all. You can see to have the neighbor relationship, we don't exchange anything about our link status advancements. We don't talk about anything about our links. As long as I know that uh, this is router two with ID 2.2.2.2, and I'm router one with ID 1.1.1.1, he's also aware of me, we are neighbors. We have formed a neighbor relationship. But that is just the beginning. As we mentioned, after the neighbor relationship, we said we have to exchange the links to the database. Now, after the neighbor relationship is formed, there is a series of packets, like database descriptors, like link state requests, link state updates, and link state acknowledgements. These will need to be exchanged later. These packets are the ones we use for synchronizing the links to the database between the two routers, router 1 and router 2, in our illustration over here. Once the link state database synchronization is fully complete and the two routers go to the stage of starting to calculate routes independently, or they are now able to calculate routes independently, the two routers are said to have established an adjacency. So in brief, we talked of our four-step process. One, establish relationship. Once one is complete and the relationship is up, we are neighbors. Second stage is exchanging or sharing the links to the Router 1 sends its links to the adverts. Router 2 sends uh, its links to the adverts. Once they have their links to the adverts fully shared, means they have the same links to the database, similar links to the database, similar entries in their links to the databases, they go independently to step number three. And step number three is where they are going to calculate the shortest path tree using the shortest path first algorithm. And finally, at step number four, they get entries from the shortest path tree they've just calculated and get them into the routing information base or the local routing, local OSPF routing table. So let us go through these processes one by one step and see what exactly takes place. It's the process of establishing an adjacency. Well, we've already just mentioned that establishing a neighbor relationship is just part of the process of establishing an adjacency. So the adjacency relationship establishment involves four steps. First, we establish a neighbor relationship. Second, we negotiate the master slave status. Third, we exchange the link state information. And fourth, we synchronize link state databases. Once the link state databases are synchronized, our adjacent relationships has been, our relationship has been established. So in the first stage, we are going to use hello packets. 
R1 sends a hello packet to R2, R2 sends a hello packet back to R1, and once R2 sends a hello packet that contains R1's router ID, if R1 receives a hello packet from R2, which contains its own router ID, it knows that uh, it is in the two-way state. We're going to talk about that. But generally, in the first step, we establish a bidirectional bi neighbor relationship. In the second step, we negotiate the master-slave status. But why do we have to negotiate the master-slave status? Well, OSPF is not people. And not phones. It's not like I know you are speaking fast or you know I started speaking, you're listening, nothing like that. So in OSPF routers need to agree on who gets to speak first when we have to speak. And that is the essence of negotiating the master-slave status. The master will always be speaking first. The slave will always be speaking last. After negotiating the master-slave status, we go ahead and describe the link state database. That is step number three. We use database descriptors to describe, to send a summary of our links to database to the neighbor that we have just discovered. After sending a summary of the links to database, let us say router one sends a summary that contains one, two, three, four, five entries in the links to database, in summary. Now this summarized links to database through a database descriptor hits router two. And maybe router two already has link one, two, and three of all these five. It knows the details of these links, but it doesn't have link four and link five. What router two will do is to start asking using link state requests. It starts asking for the detail of the link number four, link state advert number four, and also sends another link state request to ask for the details of link state advert number five. In response to the link state request for details of number four and link state request for details of number five, router one will go ahead and send a link state update for this, link state update for details of link state advert number four, and the link state update for details of link state advert number five. On receiving a link state update, router one will go ahead and send a link state acknowledgement. So this is the process that's going to take. After that exchange of LSLs and synchronization of link state databases is complete for both ends, each router independently goes to step number five. Please note that step number one, two, three, and four are done in some kind of conversation. Router one sends to router two, router two replies to router one, router one sends to router two, router two replies to router one, router two sends to router one, router one replies to uh, that, that message, router two sends, something like that. They exchange for steps one, two, three, and four. Step number five of calculation, calculation of routes is done by each of the routers independently because at that point, each router knows the entire topology of OSPF and it can do its own independent calculations. So we are going to discuss these steps in a little more detail, one by one. So let us talk about step number one. We are establishing a neighbor relationship using hello packets. So in this case, we have router one and router two. Router two's router ID is at 2.2.2.2. Forget this is an error. This is the router ID of router two, and this is the router ID, excuse me, of router one. Router two's router ID is 2.2.2.2. Router one's router ID is 1.1.1.1. What's going to happen when router one has that interface enabled uh, for OSPF? The interface will start listening to hello packets. Not only that, it also sends out hello packets. So it's sending out hello, anyone out there speaking OSPF. At the same time, it is attentive to any hello packet coming up from the outside. Now, when you go to this interface right here and also enable OSP, it starts doing the same thing, it starts listening. So let's say we did it fast on this end. And so this guy sends his first hello packet out there. Hello, I'm 1.1.1.1. I don't know who is on the link. Now, when router 2 receives this hello packet, look at this hello packet. This hello packet contains the router ID of 1.1.1.1, but does not contain the router ID of the recipient. When a router like router 2 receives such a hello packet that does not contain its own router ID, it goes to the init state. So a router goes to init state in OSPF because it received a hello packet from a neighbor who does not know its own router ID. The receiver of the hello packet does not, uh, does not have his router ID inside the hello packet. The router, that receiver goes to the init state. Of course, somewhere in the process, at some point, router one also sends, router two also sends such a hello packet that doesn't contain router one's router ID saying, I am 2.2.2.2, .2 .2 .2 .2. I don't know who is on the link. Of course, when router one receives such a hello packet, you'll also go to the init state. Now, we are skipping that stage as far as this slide is concerned. Now, that router two has received router one's router ID, is going to send a hello packet saying, oh, I am 2.2.2.2. .2 .2 .2 .2. I've seen you 1.1.1.1 according to your previous message. Now, notice that when router one receives a hello packet from a neighbor that contains his own router one's own router ID, he will go to the two state. 
So when, when a router receives a hello packet that contains its own router ID from a neighbor, it goes to the init state. Two, when a router receives a hello packet, sorry, sorry, excuse me, when a router receives a hello packet that does not contain its own router ID, it goes to the init state. When a router receives a hello packet that contains its own router ID, it goes to the two-way state. These are the first two states in the OSPF state machine. And this, after these two steps, we have formed a neighbor relationship, as you can, a neighbor relationship. As you can see, now that router one knows of 2.2.2, he will send a new hello packet saying, oh, I'm 1.1.1, and I've realized you are 2.2.2.2. When router two receives a hello packet that contains his own router ID, he also goes to the two-way state, and now I know you're router two, you know I'm router one, that's it. Now, that is what a neighbor relationship is. A router realizes and acknowledges his neighbor exists, knows him by router ID, and is ready to work with him. They do not exchange any detailed information about themselves at that state. At that stage, that is a neighbor relationship. You go to a neighborhood, you've just gone to a new neighborhood, and you've not, they know your name, uh, and they know uh, you stay in that house. They don't know details about you. You're just neighbors. That's it. You're not friends. You're just, you know, you stay there, I stay here. That's it. That's what a neighbor relationship is. But when you start looking into other details of your neighbor, how many kids they have, which school they go to, and information such as that, you're trying to establish an adjacency. You're not just neighbors. You want to know details about your neighbor. So let us look at step number two and three. So now, router one is aware he is connected to router two on the same link. He's connected to the two, the two, the two, and two, two, two is aware that he's connected to one, dot one, dot one, dot one. What's going to happen? We are going to go to the X start state. Now, first we say we go to the init state. Second, I've mentioned we go to the two way state. And I said two way is where we are neighbors. In fact, it is a stable state. Some routers just stop right there, they don't continue. The routers that continue past this point are those ones that are connected to the DR or those ones connected to the BDR. If you're not connected to the DR or BDR on the other end of the link, then you won't go beyond that state. Of course, unless you're not on the broadcast network, as you're going to see. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So in, state, in step number three, or the third state of the OSPF process is the X start state, where we are talking about starting the exchange. But before we start the exchange, we want to determine who speaks first. In fact, that is the idea behind X start. So, router one sends a database descriptor, which is empty, but with a sequence number. And it's just by assuming he's the master. Hey, I realize you're on the link, but remember when we have to talk, I will always speak first. Now, router two does exactly the same thing. He also assumes he's the master. He sends his own database descriptor, which is empty, but with a sequence number of Y. He says, no, 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 uh, uh, by the way, I'm 2.2.2.2. I'm I realize you are 1.1.1. You are the same link with me. If we happen to need to speak, don't forget I have to speak first. If I don't speak to you, please do not speak to me. Now, this router starts by assuming they're the master. How do they agree on the master? Well, they take the router ID. Whoever has the larger router ID is going to become the master. Mm. Whichever router has the larger router ID has higher priority of becoming the master. So in this case, it is true that router one started by saying, I am the master. Router two is also starting by saying, I am the master. So when router two receives the I am the master from router one, it says that router one's router ID is 1.1.1.1 is away. No, no, this can't be my master. When router, two, when router one receives the I am the master from router two, it says that the other guy's router ID is 2.2.2.2. It's greater than his router ID says, okay, I give up. You are going to be the master. And from that point, Router 1 starts communicating based on the sequence number of Router 2. So you see, now Router 1, after acknowledging that Router 2 is the master, says, okay, 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 uh, yes, you're the master, we shall speak based on your sequence number, based on your rules and regulations, I'll be speaking when you say we speak, and this is the summary of my link database. That is what we call the exchange state. The X start is the start of the exchange. Before we exchange, who should be the master and who should not be the master? They determine that based on the router ID. And after that, they go to the exchange state where they're going to use database descriptors, but this time that contain a summary of the link state database. The first database descriptors at the X start stage are empty database descriptors with only the sequence number. Now in the same order, Router 2 will send its own database descriptor containing a summary of the link state database. They will do this, they will do this only once because it contains the entire summary of the link state database. And once router 1 receives, it's going to confirm database descriptor sent by the master. 
router. <coughs> Once that is done, router one is aware of router two's link state database, and router two is aware of router one's link state database. And of course, once each router is aware of the link state database of the neighbor, please note that they are aware of the summary, mm? the summary, not the detail. They have received the summary of the link state, the link states of the neighbor. They have received the summary of the link states of the neighbors. Now, sometimes you receive a summary from router one and you have one, two, and three, but you don't have four, five, and six of these entries. What are you going to do? You're going to ask for the details of those entries, and that is the loading state. At the loading state, we are going to use link state requests, link state updates, and link state acknowledgements for each and every missing link state advert until our link state database is fully synchronized. Now, this difference, you knowing the contents of my links database and him knowing the contents of your links database, that is different from you having the contents of my links database and me having all the contents of your links database. So the purpose of the loading state is to synchronize. The purpose of the extract, the exchange state, is to inform this is the summary of my links database. This is the summary of my links database. Oh, I see. This is, you have one, two, and three. I know of only one. Can you please send me details of two? Can you again send me details of three, two? So this is what is going to happen at the loading state. We use the link state request to request for details of a particular link state advert we are missing. Based on the summary we received from him, we have X and Y, but we do not have Z. So we set up a link state request to ask for Z. Hey, can you send me details about link state advert number Z? And use the link state update to send the details that we have asked for for link state advert number Z. And after receiving the details of link state advert number Z, we are going to go ahead and send an acknowledgement. We have received that. I have received that. Thanks a lot, please. Uh, uh, please send me the link state advert of details number M also. Then process will continue until the link state database of router 1 and router 2 are fully synchronized, meaning that all the, the status of the links of this guy and the status of the links of this guy are all known by both routers. In this example, router 1 knows about this link, but router 2 also knows about this link. So let us say this is link number 1, link number 1. Now this is link number 2 for router 1, this is link number 3 for router 1. And we also have link number two for router two and link number three for router two. Now look at this example. In this case, router two knows of this link. When he sends the summary of his links, three links, router one is aware of link number one already, plus all its details. So you will ask for details of link number two and then ask for details of link number three. In the same way, when router one sends its summary in a database descriptor router 2 is aware of link number one already so you will ask for details of link number two and link number three once each router has all the three links uh link number one for router one link number two for router one and link number three for router one link number one is the same uh for router two so has link number one of router two then has link number two of router two and link number three of router two each router has all these status of the links in and details the links databases of router and router two are fully synchronized and that state we say they are in the full state let us look at these states in summary we said first when a router receives a hello packet without his own router id in the list of neighbors he goes to the init state someone is trying to establish a neighbor relationship ah but he doesn't know who i am when a router receives a router a hello packet with its own router id in the list of neighbors he goes to the two-way state once we go to the two-way state and we are not connected to a designated router or a backup designated router, that's where we stop. It is a stable state. Some routers stop at that state. Now, if a router is connected to the designated router or backup designated router, it will go to state number three, the X start. The start of the exchange, the exchange start. At that state, they want to determine who speaks first. Do you speak first if you need to speak? Do I speak first if you need to speak? And uh, this is the determination of master-slave status. We use empty database descriptor packets to determine that. The database descriptor packets contain our own uh, sequence numbers and, of course, the ID we are using. The router with the higher router ID will always be selected as the master. After the X start, we go to the exchange. We now exchange. What are we exchanging? We are exchanging the link state adverts using link state requests, link state updates, and link state Acknowledgements. After exchanging, uh, 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 actually, uh, excuse me, 
we exchange, yes, the links data adverts, but the summaries of the links data adverts. We use database descriptors for that. Excuse me. We use database descriptors for that. And after receiving summaries of our neighbors and sending them our own summaries, we are going to request for details of the entries in their summaries that we do not know about. And they will request details of entries in our summaries they do not know about. That is happening in state number five, which is the loading state. In the loading state, we use the link state request, we use the link state update and the link state acknowledgement. When we have all exchanged all these link state advert details and we have exactly the same link state database, we are at the sixth state, which is the full state. Now, most some routers stop at this state, others stop at this state. These two are called stable states of the OSPF adjacency. Uh, Process, establishment process. In the process of establishing an adjacency, these two are stable states, the two-way state and the full state. So now that we've talked about the details of what a neighbor is and an adjacency, let us try to examine a little more about the neighbor table. We talked about the neighbor table already. And we say you can run the command display OSPF here if you want to look at the neighbor table. So we have looked at all the states. We have looked at all the states, one, two, three, four, all the six states of the OSPF process. And now router one is in adjacent relationship with router two. What exactly will router one know about router two? You want to know that? Go to router one and type display OSPF here. So look at this. We see it's defining the process ID of OSPF that router one is running and the router ID of router one. And then it's just listing the neighbors that router one has. It says in area zero, at this interface, that is the interface which is in area zero on router one, and the interface IP, and also the interface name and number. It says, I have router with ID 2.2.2 .2 connected, and the IP address of that router that connects to me is 10.1.1.2, .1 which is that IP address. Mm. The state is full, meaning we are adjacent, we are neighbors in adjacency state. And the neighbor, my neighbor, router 2, is the master. Why? Because he has a larger router ID than mine. The designated router for our OSPF is 10.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. That is myself. And the backup designated router is 10.1.1.2. .1 .1 that is the other side. What do we notice from here? Well, between any two links, point to point, we are going to need some kind of designated router. This is some kind of point to point network. Now we have other details here, the date timer is imparted five seconds, the transmission timer interval, neighbor has been up for that amount of authentication sequence, there's no authentication. So this, these are the details that we can have in the neighbor table. So that is the process of forming a neighbor relationship, an adjacency relationship. Let's talk about the OSPF network types. Now, before I start talking about the designated router and backup designated router, it is important that we all understand network types that OSPF supports. The OSPF network type is a very important interface variable. For each router, an interface in OSPF is going to be in a certain network type, one of the four supported network types, either the broadcast network type, the non-broadcast multiple access network type, the point to multipoint network type, or the point to point network type. What are the differences between these network types and what's the sense? Now the variable affects OSPF operations on the interface. For example, it helps determine how to send OSPF packets and whether to elect a designated router or backup designated router, or not to elect them. The default OSPF network type of an interface is normally going to, de to depend on the data link layer encapsulation. So if our data link layer encapsulation, layer two encapsulation, is point-to-point -point protocol, the default uh, network type of OSPF is going to be different from when it is Ethernet, from when it is frame relay. Different layer two encapsulations, data link layer encapsulations, define different default OSPF network types. Now, there are four different OSPF network types, as I've mentioned, the broadcast network type, the non-broadcast multiple access, the point-to-point, -point, the point-to-multipoint network type, and the point-to-point -point network type. What is the difference between all these? Well, let's talk about them very briefly. Now, as a rule, in general, 
The network types of OSPF interfaces at both ends of the link must be the same. So if we have a router here connected to a router here, this network type at this interface must be the same as the network type at that interface. Sometimes you have routers connected to a switch in that format. The network type at that interface must be the same at that interface and at that interface if they are to be in the same OSPF process. So an OSPF network, uh, uh, otherwise the two interfaces cannot establish a neighbor relationship. An OSPF network type can be manually changed on an interface to adapt to different network scenarios. Look at this network. This is a point to point. Point to point means that one, when you send out a packet of this uh, out of this interface, there is only one destination that packet has to go to, and that is that interface. So it's one point to one point. Now, sometimes you have a network like this, but using Ethernet. And we say it for Ethernet, it defaults to a broadcast multiple access network type. Now, in a case like this, you want to go to the interface and tell you, no, no, guy, this is a point to point network type for the good of our own operations. But this, of course, has been illustrated with point to point. Uh, protocol, point-to-point -point protocol defaults to point-to-point -point network type of OSPF. P2P indicates that only two network devices can be connected to the link. A typical example is a point-to-point -point protocol link. When an interface goes, uses a point-to-point -point protocol encapsulation, the default network type of OSPF interface is point-to-point. -point. Now, we have the broadcast multiple access. Multiple access means that different, uh, different devices are accessing that same link. In this example, we have this interface. When you send out a packet there, it can either go there or it can go there. Sometimes there is even another one. Or it can go there. This is a multiple access kind of network. In a multiple access kind of network, broadcast multiple access, also simply called the broadcast OSPF network, it's an environment that allows multiple devices to access and support, and it supports the broadcasts. Broadcasts are packets that are sent by the sender, but the reason is for everyone on the network to receive them. A typical example is the Ethernet network, and when an interface uses Ethernet encapsulation, the default network type for OSPF is going to be broadcast multiple access. The other network type is the non-broadcast multiple access, NBMA. So when we use frame relay, for example, we are going to default to non-broadcast multiple access. It allows multiple network devices to access, but it doesn't support broadcasts, meaning you have to define neighbors manually. Now, as I've said, frame relay will default to that, but we also have point to point, po po excuse me, point to multipoint, point to multipoint, where you have uh, some kind of point to point logical design, something like that. This point actually connects to different points, as you can see in the network. So a point-to-multipoint -point network is formed by bundling endpoints of multiple. But as you can see, it is a modification of a different network. So non-link layer protocol is considered as a point-to-multipoint -point network by default. That one has to be manually changed from another network type. Example of this is a non-full mesh, non-broadcast multiple access network, which can be changed to a point-to-multipoint -point network. Now, there is a number of things I want to make clear at this point before going any further. We have talked about the point-to-point -point network type, the broadcast multiple access network type, the non-broadcast multiple access network type, and the point-to-multi-point network type. Now, you notice that these two network types are, brought up, are, are multiple access networks. Now, for point-to-point -point and point-to-multi-point, the story might be understandable. It takes the structure of the network we have been giving examples with, this kind of network, you know? If it is point to my point, then it is still logically something like this. So it's really point to point and another point to point. It's many point to points. So we can consider that point to point. And there is no problem in this. You be the master, I be the slave, no problem. Um, uh, I send my hello packet, you send your hello packet, no problem. The only way, the only way I, I, the only receiver of a hello packet that gets out of me is going to be that guy. The only receiver of a hello packet that gets out of that guy is going to be me. No problem. Now, when you look at a broadcast or a multiple access network, something like this, or a non-broadcast multiple access, something like this, where we can have another guy right there and another guy right there, the story is different. Why do we say so? So, let's look at this network. This is a multiple access network. Now, in practice, there is normally going to be something like a switch here that connects all these guys together. 
All right? But to simplify the topology, we sometimes draw it like that. So look at this network. So let's say this guy is 1.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. This is 2.2.2.2. .2 .2 .2. This is 3.3.3.3. This is 4.4.4.4. .4 and this is 5.5.5.5. .5 when this guy sends out a hello packet, is it coming here? Is it coming here? Is it going there? Or is it going there? It's going to all of them because they're on the same network. When this guy sends out a hello packet, is it coming here? Is it coming here? Is it going there? Or is it going there? It goes to all of them because they're on the same network. When another guy sends out a hello packet, is it going there? Is it going there? Is it going there? Is it going there? To all of them. Now, we can see that hello packets are going to move around this network until we are all neighbors. And after we are all neighbors, what did we say? We are going to have link state requests from everyone to everyone, link state updates from everyone to everyone, and link state acknowledgements from everyone to everyone. That is most likely going to saturate our network. It's going to make it too, too busy, and we want to know about everyone's links. The point is, we want to know about the links on this guy, and the links on that guy, and the links on that guy, and the links on this guy, and the links on this guy, on this guy for the OSP of process to work normally. We must know about all of them. So this guy has to send his entire links database. This guy sends his entire links database. All of them send their entire links database. And just as you see, the confusion on the screen is going to be the confusion on our links. There's going to be too much noise on the network before we actually start transmitting user information. Too much noise. Non-ending hello packets, link state requests, and links that updates, and links that updates, and links acknowledgements, and links that requests, and links that updates. And every time a network changes, from here we add another link, connect a new switch for another department. Then again we shall send updates. Then again we shall send uh, 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 sorry requests, then updates, and acknowledgements, requests, and updates, acknowledgements. This is going to make our network very very busy. That is because we are trying to have each OSPF router establishing an OSPF adjacency with all other routers. Obsessive OSPF adjacency will exist on the network, increasing the load on the devices and the number of OSPF packets that are flooded on the network. If a topology changes, as I've mentioned, links to but flooding on the network may waste bandwidth device resources. This, ladies and gentlemen, leads the engineers to thinking. What is the objective? The objective is to have one link state advert shared to two, shared to three, shared to four, shared to five. And two's link state adverts shared to one and three and four and five. And three's link state adverts shared to one and two and four and five. And four's link state adverts shared to one and two and three and five. And five's link state adverts shared to one and two and three and four. Do each of them need to send to everyone? Well, not exactly. There is a different formula. How about we elect a leader? And everyone shares their entire link state adverts, their entire link state database with the leader. So whoever needs the link state database of everyone else in the network can just ask it from the leader. Well, if router one is elected as the leader, who we shall call the designated router, it means router two will send his link state requests, link state updates, link state requests, link state updates, and link state acknowledgements will only exchange between everyone, will only be exchanged between everyone and the leader. Just that. So there is less noise on the network. It will be between this and this and this and this. Just that. Not too much noise in the network. So now, one has everyone. So now, he can share everyone's database with two. And everyone can share everyone's database with two. And share everyone's database with five. And share everyone's database with four. And share everyone's database with it. Three. Goal achieved. Without the need of congesting our network, we elect a designated router and form adjacencies with only the designated router. For the rest of the routers in the network, the broadcast, the multiple access network, we just need to stop at neighborship. You are aware I am here, and we are working together. That's all. I don't need to send you everything I know, and you send me everything you know. No need for that. I will send everything I know to him. You also send everything you know to him. He will share what you sent him to me, and he will share what I sent him 
to you. That's it. I, I don't need to be sending to you and you send to me. Why make all that noise in the network? So this is the idea behind designated router. But then there's a problem with my just completed explanation. What happens if this guy gets a problem? He's the only one that knows the entire fully complete links to database. When he gets a problem, we all have a problem. The network has a problem. So we don't let him work alone. We choose a vice president. We choose a vice leader. We choose an assistant, a backup designated router. So essentially, we shall choose a designated router and the backup designated router for the exact same role. So everyone will share their links to the database. Excuse me. Everyone will share their links to the database with the designated router. And will also share with the backup designated router. And the designated router will also share with the backup designated router. Now, what does this mean? Every router that connects with a designated router will form an adjacency with it. Any to DR, any to BDR will form an adjacency, giving us three types of routers. For any OSPF multiple access network, we shall have a designated router, we shall have a backup designated router, and with all the other routers, if they are there, will be called DR others. DR others. So in this case, designated router is that router, backup designated router is that one, all these are DR other. Now, only relationships with the DR or BDR will be adjacencies. If you're relating with something other than DR and BDR, that's going to be a non-adjacency. It's going to be a neighbor relationship. Okay, yes, I get the point. And you talk about relationship, but how do we determine the DR? Why didn't this guy become the DR? Or why didn't this guy become the DR? Or this one, or this one. Why is it this one? Well, there is an election rule, like for all elections. The interface with the highest so there is that interface in OSPF and that, and that, and that, and that. There are five interfaces sharing this multiple access network. So the interface out of those five with the highest OSPF DR priority is going to become the DR of the multiple access network. The default of the DR priority in Huawei routers is one. Meaning by default, this guy will have a one DR priority, one DR priority, one DR priority, one DR priority, one DR priority. Eh, now guy, what do you mean? You just say whoever has the highest DR priority will become the designated router. Now you're saying they are all one. Well, if there is a tie in the DR priority, then the interface that advertises a higher OSPF router ID will be elected as the designated router. So if the DR priority is the same, OSPF will compare the router ID. Remember this guy is sending hello packets out there with his own router ID, sending hello packets with his own router ID, hello packets. So whoever sends the largest router ID, assuming the DR priority is the same, will become the designated router of the network. So let's talk about the concept of the OSPF domain and the single area. An OSPF domain is a network that consists of a series of contiguous OSPF network devices that use the same policy. An OSPF domain is, in other words, called the OSPF autonomous system. An OSPF router will flood link state advertisements in the same OSPF area. We talked about the concept of the OSPF area to ensure that all routers have the same understanding of the network topology. In order, excuse me, in order to ensure that all routers have the same understanding of network topology, links to databases need to be synchronized within an area. Only within an area. And as I said in, uh, earlier, that is the whole instance of area. 
If there is only one OSPF area, the number of OSPF routers increases with the network scale and it causes problems. Number one, the link database becomes larger and larger and the size of the OSPF routing table increases, meaning that more router resources are going to be consumed that results into deterioration of device performance, which will affect data forwarding. Secondly, it is difficult to calculate routes based on a very large links database. Thirdly, when the network topology changes, links to advert flooding and shortest path fast recalculation on the entire network will bring a V load. This is the reason why when we have a large autonomous system by the count of routers in it, of course, we prefer to deploy what we call the multi-area OSPF. So OSPF introduces the concept of the area where we divide the OSPF domain into multiple areas to support larger scale networking without these three problems that I've just mentioned. The OSPF multi-area design reduces the flooding scope of the LSS because links and adverts will be flooded only within the area. Remember, all routers in the same area must have the same links to database, but not links to databases from other areas. Effectively controlling the impact of topology changes within an area which optimizes the network. Routes can be summarized at the area border to reduce. So all routes from those two guys can be summarized by this guy as they come this side. All routes from these three guys can be summarized by that guy as they come this side. And also routes from these ones are summarized by the same guy when they are going that side. So we have a smaller manageable OSPF routing table. Multi-area design also improves network scalability and facilitates large scale network construction. Now, Areas in OSPF can be classified into what you call backbone areas and non-backbone areas. Now, area zero, illustrated right here, is the backbone area. All other areas <clears throat> are non-backbone areas. When we are using only a single area, this area number can be anything. But when you are using multiple areas, we must have area zero. And if we are connecting multiple areas, such as this example autonomous system, in order to prevent inter-area loops, non-backbone areas cannot be directly connected to each other. All non-backbone areas must be connected to the backbone area. The only way for area two to communicate to area one is through area zero. We can't construct area one, area two, area zero. This is not allowed in OSPF. Now that we see the concept of areas, there is another way we can categorize OSPF routers based on where they are deployed in the multiple area design. The routers are thus classified into four different types based on their locations. First is the internal router. The internal router is one that has all interfaces belonging to the same OSPF area. This is an internal router. This is an internal router. Internal router, internal router, internal router. All its interfaces are inside the same area. The area border router is a router that has interfaces in two or more areas, but one of them, important, must be in the backbone area. Let us say someone designed some network and put area one here and area two here, and there is a router at this point. This router has an interface in area two and an interface in area one, but it does not qualify to be an area border router. An area border router must have at least an interface in area number zero. If it doesn't have an interface in area number zero, it doesn't qualify to be an area border router. The backbone router, which is number three, a backbone router is an OSPF router that has at least one interface in the backbone area. So these ones are backbone routers. These are backbone routers because they have at least one interface in area zero. This is a backbone router because it has at least an interface in that area zero. This is a backbone router because it has at least an interface in area zero. And finally, the autonomous system boundary router is the one that connects the OSPF domain to other domains, other autonomous systems. In this example, it is 
this guy. The autonomous system boundary router can be an internal router, can be an area boundary router, can really be any router. As long as it connects to an external uh, autonomous system, it is the autonomous system boundary router. It is at the boundary of the autonomous system. So when we have a small network, we are typically going to run one area of OSPF. For medium, small, medium, and small enterprise networks, we normally deploy a single area. Now, for large enterprise networks, we normally deploy multiple areas. For large enterprises, we normally deploy multiple area. So in this case, we have area zero at the core. We have area one and area two connecting aggregation to the core. So you can see area one is connected to area zero, and also area two is connected to area zero, which is meeting the requirements of multiple area design. This is area zero for large enterprises. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the OSPF working mechanism. I hope this has been informative for you, and I thank you for your